Hi, hi, hi again. Sara here, your AI-generated assistant powered by ThinkBuild Generate AI. Today, we're diving into another guide for ArchView's render upscaling on low VRAM that I think you'll really enjoy. So you asked for it, and I'm here to deliver. Not with pizza, sadly, but with upscale renders like a boss. So as you asked, I will show you how to use upscale renders. And so let's start. We begin with the normal VRAM settings for the 5090 RTX, but we want to stay safe on this hardware. We will show you later how to get under 14 gig VRAM. For that reason, we decided to use the Nunchaku model together with the Alimama Alpha Laura, which gives us more speed. For the clip model, you can always switch to smaller clip models if you run into memory issues or set the node to CPU. After that, we have the model sampling flux, which is set to a little bit less freedom, so we don't end up overloading this node. When we zoom out, we go directly to the upscaler and the tiler node. And the very first thing we want to check is the tile distribution. To do that, we turn off the LLM and start the workflow until the tiles are generated, just to see how they are organized. But before that, we reset the tiler so that the memory is clear. Now let's see what the tiler has actually done. We quickly check if it looks OK, and in this case, six tiles are absolutely fine for what we are doing. Sometimes, however, you'll notice really big overlaps between the tiles, and in those cases, it's better to tweak the settings so that the tile count comes out better. You can adjust this with the fragmentation setting. If you raise the fragmentation a little bit, the tiles become bigger, which means you end up with fewer tiles overall. This way, you can control and adjust it until you get a tiling structure that works better. Inside the tiled upscaler node, we also have a preset section. Keep in mind that presets will overwrite whatever settings you put in manually, and in this file, you can even add and use your own presets. The option full size means that it will not use tiling at all. The input is simply sent as a full size upscaled image to the process. This method works well until about seven megapixels, but beyond that point, memory will collapse on most cards and the details are usually not great when working with large images. That's why it's recommended to stick with full size upscaling only up to about two or three megapixels and not more. For our workflow, we will keep presets set to none and simply use our own settings. The upscaler itself is right in the middle of the process. Here we can decide between several approaches. We can upscale by factor using only mathematical methods, or we can upscale an image by model, or we can even use the combined method upscale with model. So what is the difference between these? The first option is not using models at all. It only relies on mathematical upscaling methods. You can select from different ones, including faster options, but I usually go with the slower one because it produces very smooth upscales. I like smooth upscales, since this gives the sampler and the refiner the opportunity to resolve and invent better and more detailed features afterwards. The Egan models come with different upscale factors and qualities, but for now we will simply take a standard upscaler, the 4DX Nomad Unimat, which you can find on the page linked below. This upscaler multiplies the size four times. When I select upscale image using model, it will upscale four times and completely ignore the upscale by factor setting. Using upscale image by model, however, will also upscale four times, but then immediately downscale it to 2x. In our case, we keep it on the mathematical method, and Langsos is more than enough for the type of image we're working with. Now let's look at the pro settings. Here we have the compositing mask blur, which defines the final overlapping when tiles are stitched together. You can think of it like a transparent gradient overlay. This value needs to be between 16 and 32. If we are using Fusion, you can keep it even at zero. Since we will be using Fusion, we keep it at a small amount like eight, just to introduce a small fade. Next, we activate both the Pro and the Generative Tile Fusion methods. What happens here is that each tile generation takes into account the surrounding tiles, so when you sample a tile, it already knows what's around it. This makes the borders much cleaner. The fusion margins are visualized in the preview as a green gradient. For example, when set to 48, you will see the gradient more clearly. If you increase it and run the process again, you will notice it stands out even more. The shift in out option moves the fusion border margin, normally pushing it outside the blur margin. At 100%, the gradient is fully green with no shorter fade. We reset it back to normal. The top left shift moves the top left corners inward or outward. We set it to 60, which makes it smaller. This setting lets you reduce overlap on the original tiles along the left and right edges, while giving more influence to the already generated tiles at the top and right edges. So in simple terms, when using generative tile fusion, you can decide how much influence the newly generated tiles on top and right have on the new tile, compared to the influence of the older, already generated tiles at the bottom and left. Tiles are always generated left to right and then top to bottom. With the preview enabled, this becomes much easier to understand, so we leave the rest as it is. The Fusion Blend defines the 100% Fusion border we just talked about when shifting the mask. Finally, here is the API key, which you should already have saved in your environment variables. 
And that, in summary, is the upscaler and the tiler node. Now let's move on to preparing the tile prompter. First, don't forget to reset the node before the first run. Then, we select an LLM. In my case, I'll take Quen 7B. We run it and wait for the prompts to be generated. Now all the tiles are generated, each with a prompt. At this stage, we need to make sure that the denoise, seed, and CNET strength are all empty for every tile. When we continue to the refiner, the first thing to check is that flux is selected. The fuse mode is inherited from the tiler, so we don't change it here. The fusion blend, though, is worth mentioning. This defines the blended area used when teaching a new tile about its surroundings. It's essentially a combination of the green borders you defined in the tiler and the complete fusion distance. In this case, it will blend at 50%, which is the best setting, so we keep it as is. The seed and all the other standard sampler settings should already be clear. Because we are using the 8-step Turbo LoRa, we'll use 8 steps here as well. CFG stays at 1 while Flux Guidance is set to 2. I personally like keeping it a little lower since this gives more freedom and results in better textures. Now, about samplers, there are mainly two categories. One category injects new noise at each step, while the other only resolves existing noise. Among the samplers, we have many noise injecting types, such as Res 2s. These are excellent when you want finer, more detailed results, but they are not suitable if you want strong consistency. The 2s means that it loads the model twice and refines twice at each step, while also injecting noise twice. For example, I used Res 6S on a combined image to invent all the details that were missing in the pixels. For consistency, however, Euler is the better choice. In this case, I will go with Res 2s, since I prefer seeing new details. Next, we go to the denoise settings. Here we push it higher, to around 0.6, because we will later use control to help maintain structure. Still, we want new details to emerge, since the base image is in really bad shape. We also select Normalize Advanced as the denoise method. This option ensures that the denoise value is fixed exactly at 0.6 on the very first step, regardless of which scheduler you are using. Remember, schedulers normally adjust the values, so this guarantees that the process always starts at 0.6. Then we set a general prompt. This is not object specific. It simply describes what we want consistently across all tiles. For example, we can ask for sharper, more refined textures, something very general. After that, we move into the testing section. Here we can save the generated tiles in the Comfy UI white folder. This gives us previews during sampling and we end up with a lot of tiles in this folder before the full process is complete. There is also the option for a fast single tile preview. This is very useful as it allows you to test one tile with your settings and I highly recommend doing this before committing to a full refinement. You can specify exactly which tile to preview by entering its number. If you wanna see the tile in its actual place on the image, you can even select multiple tile numbers to render only those tiles in their correct positions. Next, in the pro settings, we see color match. This is not really necessary, which is why it's provided as a separate output, but you can use it if you want. Personally, I prefer not to. Then we have the CNET pipe strength, which multiplies all the control nets you have in your pipe. You can set it to one or reduce it slightly to give the process a bit more freedom. The pro cache is another good feature. It stores all generated tiles in memory and uses them in a second pass. That means on the second run, instead of looking at the original tiles again, it works only with the already generated ones. Resume refinement is another helper node that allows you to rework a previous image while keeping the input image intact. This is perfect when you only want to regenerate one specific tile while keeping all the rest of the tiles unchanged. You can plug in the resume tile refinement image here and it works best with soft merge enabled. Then we have fuse space denoise. This setting acts only on the green fusion area helping to melt the borders. When set between one and two, a value of one means full green while two means no green. This helps reduce visible seam color shifts. Normally a value around 1.2 or 1.5 works very well. Keep in mind, lower values than one make it behave like a denoise filter, but only outside the green areas. Fusion complexity mask is also here, but since this tutorial is already very long, I will skip it. You can deactivate it for now as we don't need it and there are other tutorials covering it. Last in this section, we have Redux strength. This setting is related to style transfer and helps preserve the style of the image. One more useful feature I added is copy last generated seed. The reason for this is that whenever you press run, the sampler's seed value changes automatically if set to random. That means the seed you see at the end, once the image is generated, is not the one actually used. By copying the seed, you can paste it directly into the tile prompt and reuse it later if you liked the result. After that comes the enrichment pipe. For now, we keep most options turned off. However, since we are working with renders, which often have residual noise, we enable the tile upscale plus option with final details and grain removal. Here we set the scale method to Langsos and the upscale factor to 1.5x for both tiles and segments. We didn't go into segment upscaling this time, maybe we'll cover it in the next video. And that's it, we press enter and get our image. While waiting, let's talk quickly about the control pipe. This pipe manages the control nets you already know, but for each tile individually. That means when using pre-processed images for depth or canny, the input image covers the full tile size. 
This is different from normal control nets. In our setup, we use the control net upscale with 0.5 strength. Keep in mind that this control net is very strong and it greatly reduces denoise freedom. It doesn't just maintain structure and lines, it also forces color and material. So use it carefully and only if you really need it. In our case, we skip canny since we don't have important line structures. We keep it bypassed because if canny is not bypassed, the upscale control net will also not be bypassed. We select the last control net pipe node, add more if needed, and choose the depth preprocessor. And that's it, we can start sampling. Let's wait for the result. At first, it didn't do too much, so let's see why. Ah, look at that. I forgot to deactivate selected tiles only. That's why nothing showed up properly. Yeah. So remember, always turn this off or you'll only see changes in a few tiles. Let's run again with the corrected settings. And now it looks much better. Just to compare, let's do another run with res 6s. Mm. I won't go into fine tuning and per pixel denoise here, but you should. For that, create your masks in Photoshop. This gives you more freedom on areas like greenery compared to architecture. Small note, there is a bug where this only works if upscale is set to one in the tiler. And here is the result with res 6s. I hope this is helpful. That's the first step. If you repeat this process two or three times, the results keep improving with each run. One last thing we need to talk about is memory usage. Right now, this setup requires about 24 gig, but we can reduce it down to about 14 gig. To do that, we move the clip to CPU, disable the control net upscale and depth, but keep Redux enabled. Next, we lower the upscale or turn off extreme fine details in the enrichment pipe. Finally, we can reduce the tile size with a fragmentation value of 0.5. By doing all this, we go from 24 gig down to just 12.86 gig. If you liked this walkthrough, don't forget to hit the like button, ring the little notification bell, and of course, support us on Patreon. You'll also find all the other workflows and tools waiting for you over there. And there you have it, render upscaling magic in action. If the result looks weird, just blame the GPU, not me.